It's time now to hear the word of God read. So if you'd like to grab your Bibles and open to Matthew chapter 15, it's on page 870 in the Bibles you'll find in the seats. Last week we read from the start of this chapter, we saw that Jesus was getting to in, getting into some serious arguments with the Pharisees. Well, now we start off from verse 21 to see what happens next. So Matthew 15, starting at verse 21. When Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples approached him and urged him, Send her away, because she's crying after us. He replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He answered, It isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from under the master's table. Then Jesus replied to her, Woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. Moving on from there, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on a mountain and sat there. Large crowds came to him, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, those unable to speak, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd was amazed when they saw those unable to speak talking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. They gave glory to the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on the crowd, because they've already stayed with me three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want them to send them away hungry. Otherwise, they might collapse on the way. The disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in this desolate place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they said, and a few small fish. After commanding the crowd to sit down, he took the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks, broke them, gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. They all ate and were satisfied. They collected the leftover pieces, seven large baskets full. Now there were 4,000 men who had eaten besides the women and children. After dismissing the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. This is the word of the Lord. It's an interesting passage that we read. It raises all sorts of questions, but also raises lots of memories in our mind as we think, hang on, haven't we read stories like this before? But it raises some rather important questions, the most important of which I think is, who do we let in? It's a question that's asked by many different people at many different times. The government asks, who do we let in when they try and decide on the rules that they're going to make about citizenship of their country? Bouncers have to ask, who do we let in when the nightclub they're paid to look after is full and they need to work out who to let in and who needs to wait outside? Even mums ask, who do we let in when they're trying to figure out how many of the child's classmates get an invite to the birthday party? Sometimes we ask the question, who do we let in? so we can make sure there's enough food. Sometimes we do it for safety reasons, to make sure there's not too many people crammed into too small a place. And unfortunately, sometimes we ask it in order to exclude people. But here, the woman at the centre of today's story, she forces us to ask the question, who gets to be part of God's people? Who is God going to let into his church? And so as we come to see what Jesus has to say in response to this woman, I think we'll get to see exactly who God wants to be part of his church and exactly what we should be prepared to do about it. 
So let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you teach us through it and help us to become more like your son. Give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, and the will to put into practice what you will teach us from it today. Amen. So as we saw last week, Jesus has just finished having a rather heated debate with the Pharisees. He's exposed their hypocrisy and said, actually, the source of human defilement before God doesn't come from what you touch or what you eat. It comes from within the human heart. And so last week on the map, we saw this map. We saw that Jesus was kind of at the top of Israel, hanging around the Sea of Galilee. Well, this week he moves. He moves up to the area of Tyre and Sidon, not too far away. Now, that doesn't mean much to us. But to Matthew's first readers, their ears start to prick up. Jesus isn't supposed to go to Tyre and Sidon. That's where the Gentiles live. A proper Jewish rabbi, he's not going to Gentile areas. That will make you unclean. But as we saw last week, Jesus doesn't put a lot of stock in things outside of you making you unclean. So he goes to Tyre and Sidon. And then the inevitable happens. A Gentile woman comes and starts pleading with Jesus for help. Did you see how Matthew described her? Have a look at verse 22. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came and kept crying out. Now, this is actually a really odd description because there aren't any Canaanites anymore. So why would Matthew call her a Canaanite if Canaanites didn't exist? Well, the Canaanites were the people who lived in the land before God brought his people Israel to live there. The Canaanites were the people who were driven out by Joshua and Moses. In the books of Kings and Judges and Chronicles, the Canaanites are the people who are constantly warring with God. They are God's enemies and enemies of God's people. And so Matthew wants to make something really clear. This woman is an enemy of God's people. She has no right to be speaking to Jesus. And so Jesus gives the expected response. He's silent for a while. And nobody would have thought this was odd. Not only is she a Gentile, a Canaanite talking to an esteemed Jewish rabbi. She's a woman who shouldn't be approaching a man who's not her husband in public like this. She has no reason to speak to Jesus. But then the disciples start getting a bit annoyed about the fact that she's still crying out and calling after them and ask Jesus to send her away. And he says something rather odd. Verse 24. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This seems odd when we first read it, given what we know about the book of Acts. But when you think about it, it's not that odd. Jesus is the king of God's people. And here is a foreigner coming up and approaching that king. You don't have any right to appeal to the king if you're not a citizen of the nation that that person is a king of. Just imagine that I went on holiday to Denmark, I was having a good time, but then something happened and I got stuck and I needed the government's help. I'm not allowed to go up to Princess Mary and her father-in-law and say, help me out. They'll say, you're not Danish, you can't ask us for help, go to the Australian consulate. As a citizen of Australia, I'm allowed to ask my government for help, not really allowed to ask a foreign government for help. There may be extraordinary circumstances where it is appropriate to ask a foreign government for help, but those are usually few and far between. This woman has no right to come up to a foreign king and say, help me, help me. And Jesus reminds her of that. But she keeps going. She insists, no, you are the only one who can help me. And so Jesus replies. He tells her, no, there are priorities in life. Just as a family wouldn't 
feed the dogs, the pet dogs before the kids. No, you feed the kids and then you feed the pets. Just so, because he is the king of the people of Israel, he needs to make sure that they have had the chance to hear his message and respond to him before anybody else does. Jesus does this, I think, to test this woman's faith. He needs to make sure that this woman is coming to him out of faith and not out of entitlement or a sense of worthiness. And this woman passes his test with flying colours. She acknowledges, yes, I have no right to be here, but you are the only one who can help. And so because of her faith in God's mercy, Jesus heals her daughter and grants her request. She, She didn't get help from God's chosen king because she earned it. She certainly didn't deserve it. She was granted faith and membership of God's kingdom through her faith. And in that sense, she gets put in a great line of women like Rahab and Ruth, whose faith, despite their foreign status, invited them to be included in God's people and be part of Jesus' story. Now, if the wording of this woman's reply sounds familiar to your ears, even if you haven't read this story in a while, it's because we actually say a prayer every time we have communion with these words in it. The prayer book calls it the prayer of humble access. When we have the Lord's Supper, we tend to call it grace. Let's have a look at that prayer on the screen. Gracious Lord, we are not worthy to eat the crumbs under your table, but your love compels us to draw near. Often when we read the Gospels, we like to think of ourselves as the disciples the original followers, the people with the great faith who knew what Jesus was doing and were following him, no questions asked. But more often than not, we're not the disciples. We're the crowd following Jesus, grasping at straws and hoping to hear a word from him. And in this story, we're the woman. We are the people with no right to call on Jesus, to ask him for anything. The people who do not deserve an audience with the king, let alone anything from his table. But Jesus here is giving us a glimpse of what is going to come in the rest of the Bible, that membership in the kingdom of God, the right to approach God's chosen king, isn't earned by merit isn't deserved by bloodline or membership of a particular geopolitical nation, but granted through faith in the mercy of God. We're not even worthy to gather the crumbs from under the table. Yet, because of the death and resurrection of Christ, God stands us up and gives us a seat at the banquet with the king and says, your faith is enough. But how do we know that this woman isn't just a special case? How do we know that this applies not just to us, but to everyone? Well, let's have a look at what happens next. Have a look at verse 32 with me. Jesus now summoned his disciples and said, I have compassion on the crowd. Hang on, let's think back. When was the last time we saw Jesus having compassion on a crowd? It was after he'd spent some time teaching and healing them. Then he saw they were hungry, he had compassion, and he fed them miraculously with a few loaves and a few small fish. But last time he did this, he was in the middle of Israel. He was feeding his people. Yet here... We see the same story. Jesus heals and teaches a group of Gentiles, spends three days with them even. Then he feels the same gut-wrenching compassion for these Gentiles, these outsiders, as he did for his own people. 
And so then he takes a few small loaves, a few fish, miraculously feeds them and feeds them so they are all satisfied and they have baskets of food left over. Matthew really wants you to know God's chosen king, the king of God's people, didn't come just for the insiders, just for the political nation of Israel, but for everyone. Here, Jesus is amongst a bunch of people that even the outsiders of Israel thought were outsiders. And he does for them exactly what he did for his own people. He feels for them exactly what he felt for his own people. Because the people who are let in to God's kingdom is anyone who has faith, not anyone who's deserved it, not anyone who's born into the right family, but anyone who is willing to trust themselves to the mercy of God. Last week, Jesus wanted to make clear that defilement, the The sin that separates us from God doesn't come from what we touch, doesn't come from what we eat or who we interact with, but comes from our heart. And here is the next bit of that teaching. If it comes from within our own hearts, no one is better than anybody else. No one is more or less defiled than anybody else. No one is in more need of a saviour than anybody else. We are all defiled. We all need God's chosen king. And yes, he only came for his people, but membership of his people is open to anyone who will have faith. And this forces us to stop and think about our own lives. Who who are the types of people that you would consider inviting to church? The type of people you might want to read the Bible with? Are they all like you? Similar age, similar stage, similar job. In one respect, that's pretty normal. The people we meet and spend time with are likely to be similar to us. The people you meet at touch football, well, they all like touch football, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But what about the times when God sends someone into your life who's not like you, who's different, a bit socially awkward, different views on life? Are you willing to talk to them? Give them the same time of day that you would give someone who's the same as you? Far too often when it comes to thinking about who we might invite to church or Bible study, who we might share the gospel with, we find ourselves making excuses like they wouldn't want to come to church. They vote for the wrong party. They're too socially awkward They have weird views on this or that or the other. But God says that's not good enough. Membership of his people isn't restricted. God doesn't care if you don't fit in socially, if you don't say the right things or do the right things. He wants us to have faith. That means we need to be open to having a church full of people who are totally different from us but united by faith in the same God. It means we need to be open to befriending and sharing our faith with anyone who God brings across our path, no matter how different they are from us. Jesus explicitly went to those who the outsiders thought were outsiders, the people who had no right to approach him, let alone ask him for help. And he gave them the same compassion and help that he gave to his own people. And we were like that. Once we were not a people. We were outsiders with no right to approach Jesus and ask anything. But because of his mercy, because of the death and resurrection of Christ, God doesn't leave us fighting for scraps under the table but picks us up, calls us his children, and gives us a seat at the banquet with his chosen king. That means we're not better than anyone. We need to stop looking down on people because we're no better than they are. 
We are not better Christians. We are not worse Christians. We are saved by the same faith. It is God's mercy through his chosen king that has brought us into his kingdom. And that's the message that God wants us to share to whoever he brings across. Whether we think they would listen or not, whether we kind of like them or not, they all need to hear. And this is why we support so many missionaries who go to foreign countries to spread the gospel. Christianity shouldn't just be limited to suburban Australia or rural Australia. All people need to hear, no matter who they are or where they're from. And so we support the people who go to foreign countries, learn new languages, to teach people who are different from themselves that God is inviting them into his kingdom through faith. In Matthew 15, Jesus does the unthinkable to first century ears. He goes to the enemies of God's people, the ultimate outsiders, and then he invites them in as full members of God's kingdom. He feels the same compassion for them, gives them the same miraculous food, heals their diseases. And even though we We're never worthy to eat the crumbs under his table. Just like the woman, if we have faith, coming not to God because we think he owes us something or because we've earned something, but humbly throwing ourselves on his mercy, he will hear us and grant us the grace we need to fix our relationship with the God who created us so that we can be given a seat at the table. And our job is to extend that invitation to anyone who God brings across our path, whether we think they're worthy or not. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the way it teaches us. And we pray that you will prepare us to give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope that we have, that you'll help us to stop making excuses but that you'll give us the courage we need to tell anyone you bring across our path about exactly what you have done for us because of faith. And we thank you that we do not need to earn membership of your kingdom, but that it is your gift. Amen.